Κυρίε και κύριοι, καλό απόγευμα. Καλώ ήρθατε στην τελευταία μέρα εδώ του 7ου Οικονομικού Φόρουμ των Δελφών στου Δελφού. Ε, και είναι μια ακόμη πάρα πολύ σημαντική στιγμή, διότι για μένα εκτό από τιμητικό είναι και πραγματικά συναισθηματικά έτσι, πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον. Ε, η κυρία με την οποία θα συνομιλήσω ε, είναι η πρώην πρώτη κυρία τη Ουκρανία, η κυρία Κατερίνα Γιουστσέγκο. Επίσης, είναι μέλος του Μιζάμι Γκαντζάβι International Center και θα μιλήσουμε, το θέμα μας είναι «The day after the war», η μέρα μετά τον πόλεμο. Και, κυρία Γιουσέγκο, σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ που είστε εδώ. Πραγματικά ευχαριστώ. Και το πρώτο πράγμα που θέλω να ρωτήσω είναι εμείς όλη η ανθρωπότητα παρακολουθούμε αυτό που συμβαίνει στην Ουκρανία. Έχουμε τα δικά μας συναισθήματα αλλά τίποτα δεν μπορεί να αντικαταστήσει τα συναισθήματα κάποιου που ο ένας πόλεμος, μια εισβολή και η προσπάθεια μια γενοκτονίας, κατά τη γνώμη μου, συμβαίνει στη χώρα του. Οπότε, η πρώτη ερώτηση ίσως να είναι και η πιο απλή. Πώς νιώθετε για αυτά που συμβαίνουν τις τελευταίες 45 μέρες στη χώρα σας? I had no translation. You didn't have a translation? None. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> you're going to have it in a minute. So, my question is going to be like, how do you feel, because... We, humanity, we just watch on TV screens and just learn from this, um, from sites, what's going on in Ukraine. How, how do you feel since you are, this is happening in your country? How do you feel about what's happening the last, what's going on the last 45 days? Absolutely. You know, I grew up in a family. My parents were born in 1917, 1926, that lived through the Ukrainian um, Holodomor, the famine. They lived through World War II. They lived through the refugee, being refugees to the United States. And it always, always seemed history. And then suddenly that history became real life. Suddenly we were living through a genocide. We were living through a war. We were living through bombing. We were living to be refugees. I never thought in my life I would be a refugee. And so it is horrifying. We wake up every hour in the night to see what cities have been attacked. The government has been sending us on our telephone who has to run for cover, and sometimes it's 20 different cities at the same time. Please run for cover. I know as we sit here that I have tens of thousands of my fellow citizens who are sitting in metros hiding from bombs. I know there are millions who have emigrated. I know there are thousands who are dead. And I know there are, um, and have been found, and there are probably thousands more whose bodies are still laying there, and they have not been found. And so it is horrifying. Um, and it's something that has, in some ways, made us very, very upset and angry. But at the other hand, on the other hand, it has also made, it has rallied us as a people. And we understand that we have to fight. This is a genocide. If we don't fight now, it will be the end of us. As they say, if Russia stops fighting, it will be the end of the war. If Ukraine stops fighting, it will be the end of Ukraine. Ε, δεν ξέρω αν, αν ακούτε τη μετάφραση τώρα, την ακούτε, ωραία. Now I Χαίρομαι. can, thank you. Ωραία. Ε, και από τη στιγμή που μιλάμε για τη μέρα μετά τον πόλεμο, αυτή η μέρα μετά τον πόλεμο περιέχει ανθρώπους. Περιέχει και νέα παιδιά που βλέπουν, μικρά παιδιά που βλέπουν αυτό που συμβαίνει, ανθρώπους οι οποίοι θα έχουν ένα μεγάλο θυμό, αυτό πρέπει κάπως, κάπως να, να είναι διαχειρίσιμο την επόμενη μέρα. Για να υπάρχει αυτή η επόμενη μέρα, θέλει μια διαχείριση όλη αυτή η αγανάκτηση, όλος αυτός ο θυμός, ο απόλυτα δικαιολογημένο. Δεν ξέρω πώς το βλέπετε αυτό. Well, you know, the, the, the topic, the day of the war, is an optimistic one, but it's something we can talk about because I have to say that we as a people are very optimistic. We feel that victory will come soon. We feel that our army has performed better than any expectations, but that has been because they have eight years of experience in um, our war. The, you know, the, the war did not just start in our country. It started in 2014 and our um, soldiers have experienced fighting in our war. We have many veterans. We have many soldiers who have fought in UN peacekeeping missions. We have a territorial defense force of 
citizens who have signed up to, to protect our country that have amounted to 110,000, and there are many more on the waiting list. And when the new invasion started, tens of thousands, um, uh, over hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who had been working abroad came back to fight in the war. So we are very optimistic. We also, unlike many people in the West, understood that the Russian army was not as capable as most thought. We understood that the morale was low, that the equipment was outdated, that there was a great deal of corruption in the army. And so we ourselves expected it to be a disaster for them that the West did not expect. So I would say that in answer to your question that um, we, will, we have a lot to do. It will take many years but with the help of our friends and neighbors, I know we will overcome it. It will be a psychological trauma for the children. They will never overcome seeing their parents murdered. They will never overcome seeing their mothers raped. They will never overcome seeing themselves, feeling themselves raped. They will never overcome seeing their houses destroyed. On the other hand, they will come out stronger and build a better country in the future. Αναφέρεται το 2014, δεν θέλω να μιλήσουμε για το παρελθόν, θέλω για το, για το μέλλον, αλλά δεν μπορώ να αντισταθώ. Το 2004 έγινε και η αυτή πασίγνωστη πια απόπειρα ε, δολοφονίας του συζύγου σας με δηλητήριο, με μια διοξίνη, ε, που μοιάζει σαν να είναι η πρώτη επίθεση που έγινε στην ίδια την Ουκρανία, υποψήφιος πρόεδρος. Ήταν, ήταν και πρόεδρος από το 2005 μέχρι το 2010. Α, εσείς ε, από, εκείνο, από εκείνη την κατάσταση τι καταλάβατε σε σχέση με τη Ρωσία και τον Πούτιν που η, η, εμείς στη Δύση δεν το καταλάβαμε ή δεν το πιστέψαμε ίσως. Γιατί το, το γεγονός το ζήσαμε, το είδαμε και εμείς. Για πείτε μου γι' αυτό. Yes, indeed. The 2004 was the first obvious sign of their intention to take over Ukraine. Uh, my husband campaigned on the ideas of freedom, democracy, national identity, and moving toward Europe. And that is something Putin could not accept, uh, first because of his um, expansionist views of the world, and second because he knew that democracy and success, uh, a free market in Ukraine, would lead his own people to come to the streets and demand the same. So he needed a failure in Ukraine. So he tried to kill my husband. He thought he would, and it did not work. So instead, they then spent the next years in a hybrid war, um, destroying reputations, paying for demonstrations, buying the media, cyber attacks, so many different things to try to destroy Ukraine gradually. And when um, the Ukrainians did not succumb to this, they ended up having to invade uh, very openly in, um, in Crimea and Donbass in 2014. Οι άνθρωποι συνήθω τα πιο πολλά πράγματα τα μαθαίνουμε στη διάρκεια του πολέμου. Όταν ένα λαό έχει την ατυχία να είναι σε πόλεμο, μαθαίνει τη μεγαλύτερη γνώση την αποκτά στη διάρκεια του πολέμου για αυτά που συμβαίνουν και ακόμη και για γενικότερα θέματα και όχι μετά τον πόλεμο. Ποια θεωρείτε. Μια έτσι, ή ποιε θεωρείτε βασικέ γνώσει που αποκτήσατε αυτέ τι 45 μέρε και που λέτε θα, ο λαό σα και εσεί θα πρέπει να τι κουβαλάτε για πάντα, γιατί μόνο δυστυχώ στη διάρκεια του πολέμου αποκτώνται κάποιε γνώσει και κάποιε εμπειρίε. Yes, I think the first thing that it's important to understand is that Russia has one goal and one goal only in this war. That's to destroy Ukraine, Ukrainians, our people, our land, our identity. And um, they even came out with a genocide handbook a few days ago on the need to destroy the Ukrainian people. Very openly, they talk about this. We, on the other hand, also have one goal, and that's to live. And we want to live in a free, democratic country. We want to have European values of human rights, of um, tolerance. And so, you know, I think it's important to understand this, but I think it's also important to understand that this is not an issue of just Ukraine and Russia. Hmm. Ukraine is only an instrument. Please look at the letters that Putin wrote to Biden in um, December and to NATO in January of this year. He barely mentioned Ukraine. 
He talked about the need for a new security order. He wanted uh, security guarantees for Russia that would include spheres of influence. He is looking for a new geopolitical order in Europe. He is using Ukraine as an instrument. If he is able to get Ukraine, uh, I expect that he will then move further. He will reach out to the Baltic countries, to Georgia, to Moldova. He could reach out to non-NATO countries like Finland and Sweden because his goal is an expansionist. It is to go further. Η πρώτη ερώτηση που μπορούμε να κάνουμε εμείς, η πρώτη σκέψη για την επόμενη μέρα, μια πραγματική ειρήνη, πώς μπορεί να γίνει με τη Ρωσία, καταρχάς, πώς θα μπορούσε να, να, να συμβεί, να επιτευχθεί μια η, η ειρήνη μεταξύ Ουκρανίας και Ρωσίας. So how, could, how could peace become between Russia and Ukraine? Is, is it that possible in the near future? How, how you see that? Because actually when we talk about the day after, the first word that comes after a war is peace. Do you know, I, we feel very strongly that the th next three weeks are decisive. If we receive the armaments that we need from the West, I think we will win this war. I think it's very important right now. If we don't win in three weeks, then it could go on for years, but we could win now. And then, if Russia is defeated, then it's very important for us to come up with an armistice mm -hmm. with Russia. And an armistice, I want to explain carefully, is a formal agreement to cease military operations permanently. It ends a war, but it does not create peace. What, it, what can be included in an armistice is issues like a ceasefire. It could include humanitarian corridors, sending in medicine, sending in food, exchange of hostages and POWs. But we think then, then what is very important is that there is then a peace treaty. But a peace treaty is not something that can be between Ukraine and Russia. Because you, Russia has created the aggression. Russia has created the war. It is not a source of security. And that's why a peace treaty has to be multilateral. And what we foresee is that there will be an international conference that will include important countries that wish to take part, and we hope it would be the UK, the US, um, that it would include Poland, uh, Australia maybe, because they've been active, and that they would come to Ukraine into a city like Kharkiv or Brucha that have been destroyed, mm -hmm. and we would have a conference there, and at that conference we would come up with a treaty. The treaty is most important that it, it, in, that it in assures us our territorial integrity, that it assures us of our sovereignty, and that we go back to the borders that we had on January 1 of 2014, not 2022. We need to go back to, the, to our original borders when Russia invaded our country, and it should, um, we need to have Crimea back, we need to have Donbass back, and this can only be assured by a very comprehensive um, long-lasting treaty that is supported by a collaborative effort of many countries of the world. That is the first step in the day after. It's very interesting. So you, you don't pull back from the borders that you had in January. You don't pull back on this, meaning... Okay, so we would pull back that's, and that's, say, that's, that's, that's all right, after, you, after they killed tens of thousands of people, mm -hmm. destroyed many, many cities, we will allow them to, to keep things that they had in the past. Do you know, we are, I have to say, as a nation, tired of the idea of dealing with Putin and face saving and giving him an off ramp because we wonder sometimes, could that in 44 or 45 have been done with Hitler? Mm -hmm. Did the European countries discuss a face saving measure for Hitler, an off ramp, a discussion what territories he could keep and what territories he could not keep? That was not even a question. And the same situation is happening now. It is a war of aggression, it is genocide, and Putin cannot gain anything. And this, this, this will have to be the result of a unified effort of the world to say enough. Putin will only stop when he is stopped. Hmm. I agree on that. And I, before you said this is step one, meaning there's a step two, step three. Yes. What, what is step you know, two? 
Yeah, we have, I've, I have a few points I'd like to mention that we feel are important to discuss in this international conference. Um, I'm not sure I'm, I've covered them all, but I think I've covered the ones that are very important. Uh, after we talk, come up with the peace treaty, we need to, first of all, bring back our tens of thousands of citizens who were forcibly moved to Russia. There were 45,000 just a few days ago. Now there is information that many more children have been kidnapped and taken and are now being um, adopted in Russia mm -hmm. because they have a, uh, a crisis in population, so they're just stealing our children. But our, uh, the first point would be to bring those people back um, and, and to name them and actually make sure they came, come back. Second, just to be able to move back, we need to demine. The Russians have put in mines into each and every home in these cities they have been in. They have mined entire um, agricultural land so that when our farmers go out to plow, they will be blown up. So we need a great demining effort to help us deal with that. And um, then we will talk about a land lease program because Ukraine needs to have the military capability in the future to deal with this, uh, to, to make sure that we are not attacked again. So we want a strong lend lease program like other countries received after World War II to have the weapons to defend ourselves. We also need a security policy. We hope to enter NATO. We will not give up on that. If, as our president, President Zelensky has said, if we cannot receive it immediately, we would hope for some guarantees in the meanwhile Japan and South Korea, for example, received a guarantee from the United States. Mm -hmm. We would like to see a temporary guarantee, and then the steps we need to actually get into NATO. These are some of the security issues, and then, you know, as has been promised us, the EU. We expect to get into the EU in a, in a program that is speeded up. I think we have shown that um, we are worthy of that and it would give us many opportunities in economics and so on. We want our people to come back. 95% of our people have said they want to return. I think with every day, maybe a few, fewer will return. That's why we have to be quicker, and I think it's good for Europe to get us them back quicker so that, it's not, so that they don't stay there, but we, we, our people want to come back, and if we're in the EU, it will make the, the whole process easier. You know, that the next step is a huge one, and that's the economic renewal and rebuilding. And this is a very important one that we need partners for because we understand that this could take about 10 years. And what would be needed is a recovery fund or Ukrainian solidarity fund that would, that where we would collect money that we got from reparations from the Russian Central Bank and from contributions from many countries that would give money to a resilience recovery and renewal plan for our country. And this would address some of these issues rebuilding infrastructure such as airports, ports, bridges, communication towers, rebuilding residences, commercial buildings, schools, hospitals, restoring our energy supply and making us energy independent, special attention to agriculture. We are an agricultural country and this is a time to maybe make us even more efficient than we were before in terms of providing equipment and storage capacities. Um, attracting foreign investment, and I think now the world has understood that Ukraine has a, is, could be a tremendous opportunity for the future. Tourism, so many people are now yeah. saying they want to come to our you're, country. You're going to have a lot of those now. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of those. I think so. A lot I'm, of people sure. have written. You know, we need to reform our health and education systems. Um, and you know, I have to say that um, in some ways, I think that we can grow back be bigger and better. There were some things, the old communist system, some bureaucracy that were holding us back. And I think that now we can make quickly changes that were too difficult for my husband to make or to subsequent presidents to make because there was too much inertia. Now there will be such a vibrant civil society that we will be able to make those changes in, in education, science, and health, and so on. And you know, we truly hope that our friends will take specific projects. Already, I know Greece has said that they will take something in Mariupol. It would be wonderful if Greece took all the Hellenic cities mm -hmm. of Mariupol, Melitopol, Odessa, and started to work with them in coming up with a plan to make 
cities of the future. A better theaters, better hospitals, better um, education system, more cooperation. We would ask other countries to, to take their responsibility, and we could really make Ukraine something much better than it would have been if it had just progressed slowly. So we want to look at this as an opportunity as well as a tragedy. And um, I would like to say we also need a special program for the open seas because um, our ports were bombed, our seas were blockaded, two-thirds of our exports were, exports were cut, and so it's very important that we bring together all the international organizations involved with the sea to come up with new mechanisms to make sure that this never happens again. Of my points, I'm on number nine, Russia must be expelled from all international political, economic, and security organizations such as the UN Security Council. The idea that they are securing security in the world is ridiculous. Uh, from the OSCE, from WTO, from the IEA, from Interpol, they're a threat to security and cooperation in Europe and the world. They should not be involved. They should be thrown out of the G20. And I think it would be only just and appropriate if Ukraine took their place so that when policy is made, Ukraine has a role in it. You know, there should be a new vision for a world security order, and I think that Ukraine should play a part in that security. And then finally, we need tribunals. We need uh, Russia judged for genocide. We need the leaders of Russia ju uh, judged in a special Nuremberg trial, type trial, for um, the act of aggression to our country. They need to pay. If tyrants don't pay, there will be more tyrants in the future. Yeah. And that's what's very important to understand, that they have to pay. Just as, not, as Germany went through a denazification, Russia has to go through a de-Putinization. And only then can Ukraine find a way to deal with a democratic neighbor. Yeah. Since you mentioned President Zelensky, was he a surprise to you also? I mean, <laughs> was he a surprise to the, to the whole of the world? Was he a surprise the way he stood up for his, for his country? We're very proud of our president. I have to say that many of us um, have known him for a dozen more years as someone we saw every single evening on television in our living rooms, but not necessarily someone we saw as a, as a political leader. And so we, we were not sure what would happen. But I have to say that after the war started, his statements, his strength, um, have been, have really kept the country going, have given us optimism, and what's important is he has kept the West engaged. And so we're, we're very proud. Of course our people are, um, you know, we take democracy to the extremes. Any little thing we will go out to the streets to protest. If, if the president made any kinds of concessions that the people wouldn't want, they would be out in the streets in a minute. Mm -hmm. So they will keep him <laughs> straight. On the other hand, right now, we're, we're very happy. And OK, since you're a former first lady, my idea is like there are a lot of Ukrainians looking at you and listening to you. A message that you want to send them uh, for the days to come and for the day after the war, just for one minute, right, okay. right at the end. I think my message to Ukrainians is that finally the world understands what our history was, what our culture is, what our psychology is. Finally the world understands us. And finally, after so many centuries where we did not have the support of the world, we have the support of the world now. And we're so happy for that. And now we will win this war and we will come back bigger and better and stronger. Ms. Yuchenko, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.